Good morning and welcome to the forum. My name is Malcolm Young. I'm the Dean of Grace Cathedral. It's good to see all of you here. Um, outside, um, we're having such uh, extreme poor air quality because the fire is up in Butte County and we're definitely keeping everybody up there in our prayers. It's just been um, a very, very difficult time for people in Northern California. We've also, um, this is kind of a time in our cathedral life of just reflection also. Today is the um, 100th anniversary of the armistice that ended the Great War, ended World War I. And so uh, we're going to be having a requiem service upstairs, a requiem mass. Um, a 4A requiem is what we're um, doing. And as we were planning this forever ago, I think it's been years actually that we've been planning to have you come. It has. Uh, yeah. We were planning also to have um, the Queer Divine Rite, which is the work of um, our guest today. Um, it's going to be a beautiful, beautiful service um, for people who've been persecuted because of their sexual orientation or because of their gender expression. Um, and then this afternoon, we're also having the Royal British Legion come. That's where we, we drop the poppies down from the a oh, rafters. What they, time is that? Three o'clock. Okay. You've got to check it out if you can. Yeah. <laughs> you may have had enough church by then. <laughs> well, I'm living here, so it's, Right, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's an easy fine. commute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Our guest today is the creator and composer of this Requiem Mass, a queer divine rite. He is one of America's most unique voices in music theater, a United States artist, Beresford Fellow in Music, a creative capital artist, and a three-time recipient of the MAP Fund Grant. He has been presented and commissioned by the Under the Radar Festival at the New York Public Theater, Portland Institute for Contemporary Art, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, Centre Pompidou, and many others. <coughs> his collaborations with choreography includes work with Joe Good Performance Group, and his film score includes music for the Sundance premiere documentary, We Were Here. He has self-released five, self five albums on his own label, Napoleon Records. Please join me in welcoming Holcomb Walker. I'm so glad to see you. I remember when I was, um, it, when, when my wife and I were um, living in Mountain View, we'd go to the Starbucks coffee and they gave us like those little cards. Oh yeah. And one of them was one of your songs. You remember that? Oh my gosh, I, I totally remember. <laughs> I totally remember it. Because that was like 2011. You know, when you're yeah. an older person, it's... <laughs> I guess that's not very long ago. <laughs> I am 43, so I, I'm sort of older. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, um, I love that song. And oh, thank you. Even yeah, as I was coming here today on my bicycle, I was kind of singing it in the back of my head and yeah. thinking, wow, I can't believe I get to talk to Holcomb today. Cool. Great That's guy. called Hardliners, that song. Hardliners, yeah, exactly. Hardliners, I yeah. love that song. Oh, I thanks. love that song. I you like must it too. see people who come back <laughs> all the time who, who've heard your music in some way or other and, and um, make that connection. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I haven't been publishing music as prolifically as I had been before 2011. I've been working on this, these kinds of projects, yeah. so it's a little different in that if you aren't in that particular city at that time, you might not see it. So, But yeah, from back in those days, there are people still turning out for the choir, for example. Oh, who, yeah, right. Yeah, just heard oh, about cool. it because they were fans of a record or a song or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's neat. When you were a child, what, what, what did music mean for you? And what was it like, um, kind of, <laughs> what was your music, for, like first musical memories? And, you know, were your parents into this or were... Uh, you know, they were. I, it, it kind of relates to the, the, the queer theme of the project because what music meant to me as a child was feeling alienated and different. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I, it was a problematic relationship. I, I was a really sensitive, fey little boy. Yeah. And uh, I got, you know, teased by the boys because they wanted me sitting at the girls' table, and then the girls just loved me. The girls just, I, they just... I can totally imagine that. The girls loved me. They considered me one of their own. And, this, and I wasn't good at sports, so you can imagine in the kind of gendered youth sort of thing, which I really think comes from adults, but um, I was sort of bullied, and I was also this prodigal pianist. So from a young age, I, I began learning by ear. I, I mean, like, at two. So I had... I had more of an ability when I was young to hear music almost interdimensionally in my mind and kind of record it and I could see all the parts and play them back. And so I started having that experience and just going to the piano and working out the parts. Like if we saw a musical, I would, my parents would notice that I sat down and was working out all the parts. And so they thought, oh, well, we should get in piano lessons. So, so this is how I started getting into music. It was just something that was happening to me. It was an experience I was just having in my head. 
Um, but unfortunately, it kind of ran parallel with um, being different and, and, and not wanting to be different. And that was an interesting experience through elementary school, it, being really musical and sort of put on a pedestal in a classroom right. environment all the time and being different were sort of one thing. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it was kind of a bummer. Oh, I can totally imagine that. Yeah. What kind of music did you, do you remember listening to as a child? I mean... Um, my, my, par my parents were really into um, French chans chansons françaises, like yeah. Jacques Brel, and um, they were all, my mom was into Dolly Parton. Um, yeah. uh, uh, we listened to a lot of um, uh, 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 Simon and Garfunkel. Um, uh, uh, gosh, I'm, I, it's the morning, so the part of my brain that remembers names is not on. Is not on. But uh, some, those kinds of things. Um, like folk music like Bob Dylan and those kind of folk you music. You know, not so much, weirdly. They had very specific tastes. Kenny, uh, my mother loved um, Willie Nelson. Willie Nelson, yeah. Well, they had very specific tastes. It, it didn't include a lot of the sort of, I think the closest we got to, to um, uh, Bob Dylan was... Um, um, the answer, my friend, is oh, yeah, right, in right, exactly. Who am I not thinking of here? <laughs> Yeah. Peter well, Peter, Paul, and Mary, yeah, my mother loved them. Yeah. Joan Baez, yeah. yeah. Joan Baez. And I think the one thing that, that I really remember is that as me and my sister got older, um, we moved to France when in third grade, and um, we had this, like, Citroën, you know, those Citroëns? Yes, right. And it was, seemed so from the future that time with the hydraulic, like, <laughs> suspension, and we would get in this Citroën, and we lived in Monte Carlo, which was so bizarre, but it was because my dad started a business there for his, the company he worked for, and it's sort of like Las Vegas, a tax-free zone. And, and we would drive from Monte Carlo to Nice along the Riviera playing Jean-Michel Jarre's Oxygen. Do you remember this? <laughs> And my whole family bonded over this electronica, electronic music. It was like super psychedelic and electric. And we were in this like car from the future, like driving <laughs> on this sunny Mediterranean. This, and this was third grade. This was probably one of the more profound experiences of music that like influenced me and uh, that my family brought into the picture was that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And That's then we got into Enya. My family had like these certain things that we all just loved, like Jean-Michel Jarre, Enya, Dolly Parton. You should make like a Spotify playlist yeah. <laughs> of music from yeah. your childhood. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> it would be really interesting. It I would bet be. it would be the only one of its kind. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Jack Brel. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's so great. Yeah, it was strange. Mix. So when it ca came time to like leave home, um, you, you moved down to Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Like, how did you decide to do that? I mean, because again, that's like, that, I mean, it took a lot of courage to kind of step out of the normal way that. You know, kind of. I, I, when I told my son about this, he said, "Wow, Dad, that's even back before the people were taking gap years." Gap years. <laughs> I took a gap year. You, you took a gap year, but yeah, I was a pioneer. You're in the a gap pioneer, year. like one of the first gap year mit takers. I was. It was unusual. Well, um, actually, it really relates to the project as well. And bear in mind, I didn't come out till the end of college. So this is high school. During high school, I. Uh, really coming out of the Jean-Michel Jarre phase, I got into electronic music and keyboards and synthesizers. Uh -huh. And then I got into MIDI programming and arranging, and this was the earliest exposure I was having to multi-timbral arrangement, which is just the, what people do with symphonies or anything. Yeah. But I was doing it um, on Apple II computers. And um, I, I actually started writing these little produced songs and secretly recording vocals on them. And there was a, a studio electronics company in Los Angeles that had a song competition that I secretly sent a tape into. And I was 13, and I didn't like win the competition, but the fellow running it, like took an interest in me and became sort of my mentor wow. and started sending me free electronics. So I started to have this huge studio of free electronics and he flew me to LA and developed a relationship with me and his name was Wayne Henriksen. And by the time I was 18, he said, I'm breaking away from this company and I'm starting a label and I'm raising $100,000 and I want you to be our first artist and I want to sign you. So that was what was the conversation going into me graduating from high school and we decided, my parents and I, I you know, I got their they're, they were on board with it, that I was going to, I got into Yale, which is where your yeah. son goes, and I deferred for a year so I could go sign this deal, have a sort of a job, record a record and album, and see if it went anywhere. Um, unfortunately, what happened is when we got, Wayne was, was gay, and, when, and he was HIV positive, and when I got down there in the 
uh, summer of 93, he, he picked me up at the airport and told me that, you know, he had just de started developing AIDS symptoms oh, for the terrible. first time. Oh. And he died six months later. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. And if you remember in, 2000, in, in 94, that was the year Philadelphia, the film came out. Yes, right. And right. He, you remember him walking around with the, the, the IV bag and he had um, t a toxoplasmosis yeah, brain yeah infection. That's exactly what, what Wayne died from, and that's exactly how he died. And I actually lived with him part of the time when I first got down there, and, and then I had to move out because I was 18 and I couldn't really... Um, pro he was in this huge house and I had a bedroom in it, and it was always planned that I would move out. But I ended up moving out into his best friend's house yeah. who had an, a room, and I became his roommate. So it was unusual that when I was 18 and 19, I was not out. All my best friends were gay men in their 40s in Los Angeles who had lost everyone they knew to AIDS and were having uh, memorial services every weekend for more friends and, and, and peers. And, of course, Wayne died. Um, yeah, so yeah. It, was a, it was a profoundly inter interesting and difficult time. Yeah, I, I that have year a hard off, time even my gap year. That was my gap, gap year. year. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, so. I have a hard time even talking to people about what it was like. I, I, I mean, so on the stage, we had uh, one of our guests what was ta talking about, and I mean, I started like almost weeping while I was talking to them because, yeah. you know, that we were doing ministry with people who were, we had hundreds of funerals at these tiny churches, and yeah. it was just, it was heartbreaking. It's just hard to describe how much of a crisis it was. Yeah. Yeah, I was just, I did an interview on KALW, and a lot of people hear a Requiem Mass, a Queer Divine Rite, and they think, so what, they ask things like, so what is it that made you want to write a Requiem about the AIDS epidemic? And I say, well, it's not a Requiem about the AIDS epidemic. It's a Requiem that invokes the peaceful repose of people who've been persecuted for their gender and sexual diversity. But if, of course, if you think about the AIDS epidemic, which would have been an epidemic whether or not gay men were entirely marginalized at that mm -hmm. time, when you introduce that marginalization and persecution and oppression and terrible social injustice that was occurring in a mainstream sense onto a population that is suffering a public health crisis, yeah. I mean, you get Reagan not talking about it for five years. You get government not responding for yeah. five years. You get uh, funding money not being into research. I mean, you get, and, and what I said in the interview is what you get is hell on earth. Yeah. What you get is mankind making hell on earth. You know, it's, it's one thing for it to be a, a, a crisis, and it's not another thing for sort of the, the worst parts of mankind to be kind of amplified in the yeah. crisis. So, so this, this Requiem really addresses that, which of course is very relevant to the AIDS crisis, and of course it's addressing anyone who died um, suffering persecution. And I think just one of the choir members the other day, who was a, a, a nurse, uh, in, a, in, in a psych nurse was telling me that she was a student nurse in 81 in SF General and she remembers not being robed up or clocked in and they weren't allowed to touch the pace, patients with KS. Mm. But she came in and this young man was very alone and scared and she just remembers holding his hand and how much it meant to him and to her in that moment and that she would be fired for it. Mm. Well, that's what um, I was thinking. It's not just the institutional. It's just like the isolation of just... The isolation, yeah. Know, to, 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 be in, to die alone. Yeah. I mean, and, and, then, and then to have no one to, to even give you a funeral. I mean, it was just... It, yeah. There's so many heartbreaking elements to it. Yeah. Um, and I think anybody who hears about what the project is and has come through that experience immediately makes those connections. Yeah. And the project also kind of uh, looks to the ways that in some ways, obviously, religious mores have amplified, created, or just resonated with that kind of persecution. And, and obviously that's not necessarily, that's not true of the current Episcopalian um, perspective at all, or mm -hmm. even at that time. But, um, but it looks to the ways, it, it specifically looks to the ways that um, religion has been a part of that Making oppression and worst, persecution. Making it worse, basically, yeah. Yeah, and it kind of reimagines uh, this ceremonial context of this requiem as if that just sort of is absolutely not the case, you know? So it, 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 in that way, it's a cathartic experience for anybody who's suffered sort of malchurch or a, a hard experience for their gender or sexual identity from their past, being alienated by their family or their church it creates an experience where they're having this uncanny like connection with some of their childhood loving experiences with church that sort of live right next to their feelings of being okay. alienated or unaccepted and they're having a kind of healing of that division. Yeah, that's, so that's a, this is something that happens. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, so it must have been so strange to go from that. I, I, mean, I, I mean, I felt it strange when I went from being in an inner city church where everybody was dying of AIDS to moving to a suburban parish. Mm. I mean, it must have felt, felt very strange to show up at Yale and have everybody else just kind of still be 
continuous through their high school experience, and then you've had this yeah. just absolutely life-changing, shocking experience in Los Angeles. Well, you nailed it. Yeah, I'm glad you, you picked that up. Yes. <laughs> yes, it was, I mean, I'd been living in my own apartment, yeah, um, and yeah. suddenly I'm back in uh, dorms, freshman dorms with freshmen who had never Vanderbilt lived. In Vanderbilt Hall. In, yes, not, well, my best friend lived in Vanderbilt yeah. Hall. <laughs> um, I lived, you know, just 50 feet from there, but um, uh, yeah, yeah, and it, it was strange. And it, I will say that it, it was one of the sort of things that contributed to me kind of falling into depression in college. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and I actually, I, I dropped out of school my junior year for, because I was so depressed. There was many factors. It was ultimately because I was repressed. Um, but uh, yeah, I, it was hard going back to school. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It was hard. Definitely. But what did it mean for you musically? Like, I mean, I, I, you know, they must have been so glad to see you there. I mean, you had such skills in terms of, I mean, it just seems like a, an environment that appreciates people who have musical skills. Oh, yeah. And the acapella scene was really influential for me. I joined this group called the Dukes Men of Yale, and um, they're, uh, they were, they're one of the youngest singing groups at, at, at Yale, and they've also become the first men's singing group that degendered, which is really lovely. They always were kind of the edgiest, kind of maybe gayest, you could even say. Oh, they were all so gay, to be honest. But um, <laughs> it, when you get to Yale, they say, it's all right, it's okay, one in four of you are gay. They, that's what they said. It's a very gay college. Um, but... And I was, again, not out until the end of college. Um, but uh, uh, the a cappella experience, I ended up music directing the group. Um, I ended up uh, uh, arranging songs. And the songs I arranged were uh, very cathartic, gender-oriented songs. Um, one is called What a Good Boy. Uh, another one is called I'll Back You Up. It's this love song by Dave Matthews. That's, I mean, so I, I, I ended up sort of exploring my cathartic heartbreak um, you know, milieu with a cappella singing, which is itself the sort of predecessor to me doing choral arrangements or even symphonic or ensemble arrangements. Um, yeah. So it was really influential. And also at Yale, there was a lot of indie bands going on, and I was a producer and engineer because I had this experience in oh, electronic yeah, music course, production. Exactly. So I was producing and engineering things for all these young people who had no idea how to do that sort of thing. Right, and they're right. like, we want to make an album, how do we do it? We yeah. want to master the record, how do we do it? Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. And so when you left there, um, it, it, like, what was your life like after that? You, it was you, a mess. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because I just try to think. There's like, um, you know, there's a there's a there's a solid period of time between you know when you left and when I listened to you on the on my computer. <laughs> That's true. Well, it's interesting. I moved I knew, I moved to San Francisco in 1998, and I lived here for about six years. And I felt and it, I, I mean, those of you who may have been here at that time, it was hard not to fall backwards into a high paying dot com job. Yeah. That's what I did, and I I um. It was, that's a funny story I don't even want to get into, but I used the job to pay for my first yeah. couple of records. Um, I self-produced a couple of records. Um, and yeah, that's, that would be a real high-level description of what was happening. The whole time you were aware, though, that you're like, I'm a musical person, I'm just doing this to get through the night, or is it like, I'm, I'm a 22-year-old and I'm trying to figure out what my future's gonna be? Like, which orientation were you in that, in, of those two, between those two spots? I was, let's see, I think I was 23 by the time I graduated from college because yeah, right, the gap, the gap year. year. At yeah. the time, I was like, oh, I'm so old. <laughs> I mean, I'm almost 25. <laughs> um, and uh, I think I was always sure I wanted to have a career in music. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I got the job to pay for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and interestingly, the first record I put out was called Advertising Space. And the song Advertising Space um, is about being gay. Yeah. Um, and being, and it, so I, being out and gay was a part of what I was putting forward in a pop record context at a time when people weren't really doing that. And I will just summarize that for the next 10 years, I performed and promoted myself as an out gay pop indie artist and realized only in the last few years how traumatizing that was uh -huh. because I at that time and to this day, the music industry is a machismo, patriarchal, macho, beer selling industry yeah. that, that, that is, is the kind of place where people will say to your face, well, we'd sign you, we love you, you're a genius, but we can't be a gay label, and we already have a gay artist. Right. We'd love you to come on this tour, but I think you're a little gay for it. Wow. I mean, this is, the, this is what happened. Yeah. So, I, but I always just had this kind of moral sort of perspective that I was doing the right thing, being an out artist. And what ended up happening is that um, 
when I got to Portland, I sort of crossed over from mainstream pop music ambitions to the performing arts, the world of the performing arts center. Oh and these are really different worlds. They are. Mainstream music sells beer and radio and events and yeah, anything that'll get you drinking is what mainstream music is about, in my opinion. That is a really cruel summary. <laughs> But it's, it's true. It's Everywhere you play is a club or a bar, and you're selling drinks, and that's how they make money. And, and everything you're doing is about product placement or getting your song in a movie and TV. This is how you make money. The Performing Arts Center is about creating culture, and they, they, it's not about making money. It's a nonprofit model. It's about getting the money together to create something for culture. And it used, it's usually a little more merit meritocratic. Of course, it's political. But... Um, <laughs> But I, I, I went from a world where people were like, you're too gay, you're too gay for this tour, you're too gay for this label, you're, can you just be a little less out? Why do you have to be so gay? To um, a world that was like, you're not gay enough, you just, can you really just amp it up? I mean, this is, I love what you're doing with the queer thing. I love, you're really speaking to something here. So I, was, I, just, sort of, I just sort of realized like, oh, this is, this is what I should be doing. Um, yeah. You know, it's funny, because I, 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 we are on this per, um, continuum of making you, progress, <laughs> and you're so wise, and it's so helpful to hear about, because a lot of times when you talk, I, 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 things that I kind of knew in a deep part of myself but didn't really recognize, I kind of come to the surface, and you're right, that yeah. kind of anti, like, who are the other, I mean, and I can imagine you being compared to the other gay artists, and, yeah. oh, he's just like the Rufus Wainwright, and he's just yeah. like, even when you may not have anything to do with them except, except that, that part. Yeah. I remember Rufus was, I remember he, he DreamWorks was the c convergence of Steven Spielberg, David Geffen, and some third guy who was just as big as all of them, and they yeah. all got behind Rufus Wainwright. Right. And he still had trouble kicking his career off. That's yeah. how... how yeah, and to this day, do you know a mainstream male actor in mainstream cinema who's out and gay? You can't do it. I have friends who are actors who are still closeted because they want to have the potential of being cast in a mainstream leading male role in an action film. Yeah, yeah. So it's sort of, this is where things are. I mean, it's obviously we've made a lot of progress, but in Hollywood, it's sort of this, this double-edged thing where we're like, oh, of course we love our QPOC artists, and we put them on a pedestal, and in the back room, we're like, oh, we can't cast him, he's gay, because this yeah. is a mainstream action film. Wow. So, you know, this is, this is the... This is the world. Yeah, yeah it yeah, is. Yeah. It's so helpful to have somebody like draw the curtains back and help me to see out the window and yeah. recognize it. <laughs> yeah. So, so let's talk a little bit about just the project of the divine queer right. I, yeah. I, I mean, like, how did it come into being? Like, wh like, where did you get the inspiration for this? Yeah. I, I'm so curious about, um, you know, because I just I don't get the sense that you were. I mean, if someone said it when you were 23, you know, that this is something that is going to be a big part of your life, you, you probably wouldn't have. You, you, you may have been a surprise. I don't know. What, when did you first start thinking about this? I first started thinking about this immediately following Proposition 8. Oh, yeah. I was driving on I-5 in the middle of nowhere, and I heard the news on the radio. And, I re and it came, I think, mid-sentence of Catholic Church, Mormon Church, yeah. yada, yada, yada. Do you remember that? I do. All that it's institutional terrible. support. Yeah, all the money that went into All the, the money. Oh, from the terrible. Mormon Church and the Catholic yeah. Church, and I, I'm not trying to like badmouth anybody who's Catholic or Mormon. I have a lot of Catholic and Mormon friends. I'm just saying that that made me think at that time. Oh well, these institutions need an intervention. <laughs> and I, I just, I, I had been, I had a musical partner, Ben Landsberg, that went to Yale with me and was also in the Dukesman. And at that time, we were collaborating on everything. And Ben Landsberg is just an amazing person. We, we kind of uncoupled a bit musically. We he, we're doing our own things now. But at that time. Um, he was working as a music director in Episcopalian church. He was gigging as a choir singer and director in various churches. Wow. And he was raised with church, and he was like a musicologist. He was almost like a Jeff yeah. Hookum in ways. He knows ceremony. He knows a lot. And he was bringing this information into our collaborations and our concert making because it matched my style of creating cathartic experiences for audiences that were, I guess you could say, spiritual and cathartic, or something like this. Yeah. And um, we would talk about it when we wrote songs, we would talk about it when we constructed albums and when we made concerts. Like, this was how we formed things. And I had this idea of like talking to him about how we might create a, litur a liturg 
like liturgical music. That's great. And he introduced me to Dean, uh, R- right, Reverend uh, 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 Nathan LaRue, yeah. Dean, Dean, Dean oh, LaRue, he's great. who was the acting dean at that time yeah. at Trinity Episcopal Cathedral in Portland. And he is a uh, intellectual young uh, dean who- He's thoughtful and he's kind, super he's thoughtful. gentle. And, and he's gay. Yeah, just a lovely person. Yes, and he just <coughs> was like almost a dramaturg who inspired me to keep moving forward and per- we arrived at the idea of a requiem as a form because of the way requiems had become a concert form in the 20th century. We thought it'd be fun to bring it back to its foray, oh, ceremonially yes, presented exactly. roots yeah. as funerary service. And, and in doing so, to really explore the theatricality of ceremony um, and the convergence of ceremony as theater and theater as ceremony and the kind of overlapping social, cultural Im- impact of these things and purpose and intention and bring, letting the music be the thing that unites it all. And, and, and uh, when I, I kind of brought Trinity Cathedral and Portland Institute for Contemporary Art, who were the presenters and commissioners of the work together, the Angela Maddox, who actually came from Yerba Buena Center for the Arts and went up there, said, I really want you to explore community mm. engagement with this work. Yeah. And she encouraged me to start having public workshops. So we just started having public workshops where I said, I'm going to be doing this thing. Why don't you come and we're going to sing? I mean, it was really quite an open call. And so from the people whom arrived in conversation with them, I learned a lot about what the sort of public, the, the community intention, uh, sort of dreams were for the possibilities of this. Yeah. And I began just writing music that programmatically executed that based on the Latin mass form that Dean LaRue helped to sort of dramaturgically kind of guide. Wow. Um, so that's sort of how the project came into being. It's so interesting. I mean, I wonder, I mean, I, I, I get the sense, and I don't know if this is correct or not correct, but just religion just wasn't very much of a, a you know, net, not positive, not negative, just not really present. For so, me? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, no. Yeah, which I think, <laughs> I'm, I'm meaning so many people who are just exactly in that. I mean, I think that's the, I think that's what San Francisco's like now. I mean, yeah. the people I meet on the street, it's not like, uh, like, I, I say to them, oh, I'm sorry, you've had such a bad experience with the church. It's just like, they haven't had any church Any experience, experience yeah, no. But I mean, what was it like to just kind of first experienced church through like Nathan and through like this project and Trinity. I mean, there must have been some, I mean, positive things and negative things too, but. There really has been no negative things. Oh, good. I mean, there really have been no negative things. I think if we had tried to sort of activistly intervene in a Catholic congregation or something, we would have maybe experienced negative things. Yeah. We, we had a lot of community partnerships, a lot of community um, meetings, roundtables with people coming from a- areas advocating for LGBTQ affirmation in, 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 in um, communities of faith. People who are steeped in liturgical music, choral directors, uh, everything. And yeah. we, we would talk, and a lot of people were saying, you know, you can shoot for the, the sort of um, the, the non-affirming space. Try to make something that's gonna reach a Baptist church somewhere. But you're, you're going you're gonna to run up to, against a lot of problems. Yeah. And they said, you're not, you're not missing the mark by just doing it in the churches that will welcome it. Because within those congregations, there are people who still need to be reached. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And this, this whole, I mean, it's really, I look at this as a, an event for the entire community. It's Absolutely. Everyone in San Francisco, everyone in Portland. Right. And, you know, I mean, um, it, everybody in Sydney, too. Yeah. How has it changed from, like, when you first started in Portland to Sydney to here? I, I'm totally curious about how it's evolved or developed or... Well, I'm excited to see what happens Friday and Saturday because I have a feeling that after, and we're documenting it, and, yeah. when, when, when we, and we're going to meet again in January to watch it as, as a group. And I have a feeling that when we see it, and then if we go back and look at Portland, Portland will, I think, end up looking like, which was a profound experience, I'm seeing the Portland singers in the audience, <laughs> um, will end up looking like quite conservative in a way. Um, uh, quite hemmed in. Not that we're doing anything totally outrageous, but, um, but there's something about this, the group coming together in San Francisco, the reading by Vicki Gray, the sermon by Marvin K. White. This place has been steeped in a kind of, you know, look at Glide, look at, uh, look yeah. at Grace, that you've been bringing queer voice into a, a liturgical space for, for, for quite some time now. There's, a, a more, there's an ease about it. There's, um, there's like a, a breath of fresh air about it. And when you provide a, a, a context that's even more focused on it, people are really going deep um, a, about, about it. 
and it and it and it and and broad. So it just I don't know. It's hard to say because it hasn't happened yet. But I will say that San Francisco, um, in the the roundtables we put together, put a huge emphasis on making sure that the most marginalized voices within the LGBT community would we we would do all of the work we could to try and put them at the center of the experience. Um, as opposed to trying to invite sort of a tokenistic diversity um, participating in something. So there's been a lot of work in that arena, which has been a prof probably the most profound experience I've had with the project because you realize that people, uh, you know, liberal people like myself are not necessarily doing the work we imagine have, has to be done, and when we actually try to do it, there are all these structural impediments to it that stop you and stop everyone from doing it. it, it, it so that's been a remarkable experience, that, that what's happening in the Bay Area. But, but regardless, there has been some level of success in that, that world. So the group that's come together is really uh, amazing. I don't know how else to put it. Um, yeah. Right, exactly. It's almost like you have a track record. It's not like there's some new thing totally. And so people have an idea they, and they can see what the other ones were like. And, and so it, it does mean you may have a broader group of people to be able to draw from in terms of the artists who are participating with you. Is that, is that right? Yeah. I, it, well, the piece really wants to serve the people arriving to make, who are going to make it. Yeah. So I look to the people who show up in the room and I kind of ask them what they want, either directly or indirectly, and then I try to guide them into what what they'd like to do. And in this case, it's interesting because we have a dozen of the Portland singers coming down this week to join oh, that's us. Great. And I'm so glad because I, it, it's, um, it's going to be so nice for me, t for me to have some fellowship in the people who've been with the project from the beginning to see how it's grown and changed. Right. And to see how it can grow and change. Because when we go back to Portland, I, I think it'll inform us in our lives. You know, it's, we're, it, Portland is a funny place, you know. It's, 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 you know, it's just, it's different. <laughs> and uh, it's fun to come to a place like San Francisco and to, to experience how this project breathes here, you yeah, know. It must be fun to have that continuity because they're kind of your, like your teammates from before and yeah. here they are coming all this way to, to support for the project yeah. here too. Yeah, I'm talking in a lot of general terms because this is a really hard topic. Um. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is a hard topic. Yeah. So tell me, like, moving on to an easier topic. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it seems to me, I mean, I, I would like it if, you, you know, you're pr you produced so many other people's work in, because you had that experience in making records and, um, and you, you produced your own work. And I, I wondered, you know, what are the advantages of having you produce your own work versus somebody else producing your own work? And then maybe you could talk about more like the technical challenges of producing something like this and how it differs from what you did before. Well, I, I actually do think of myself as a producer. I always have. Um, I, I don't know if other people think of me that way. I also think of myself as a lyricist, and I don't think anyone else does. I say that just because I, everyone thinks of me as a singer and, a, and an airhead, um, a little bit. I don't at all. Okay, good. Um, when you work with me, you might. Um, you might, if you work with me. I think part of the reason is because I'm doing a lot of different things, and I'm not advertising it. But... Um, uh, uh, I, I think of myself as a producer, and I, I, I like, I, even in this project, I think of myself as a producer. I'm certainly not self-producing this project. YBCA is producing this project, and, um, and Isabel is producing this project, and Rebecca, in a sense, is producing yeah, this Rebecca's project. Other amazing. people are really doing a lot to make this happen, and I'm kind of overseeing the ship. But... Um, I like producing my own work. I, I do a lot of other projects where I produce it from soup to nuts. Mm -hmm. um, and I, um, I like that because I've tried to work with outside producers and I just find that um, in an interdisciplinary context where the interrelationship of all the elements, the subtle interrelationship of all the elements is what makes it to have its unique quality, it is very hard to achieve that with an outside producer. Um, and so my challenge with this piece is working with teams of different people who are overseen by another team of people mm -hmm. and to make all of the different elements interrelate as if they are one uh, incontrovertible uh, whole. Organic whole. Yeah, that it could be no other way. Yeah. And I can tell you that we are there. Like, we're, wow. it, that I, this has been a year-long project, and I can already see what's going to happen Friday, Saturday night, and I already have full confidence. And a part of that process for me is that I focus on the choir. I focus only on the choir. And everything else underscores the choir's experience. The ensemble under is like a score. If the choir were a film, the ensemble that plays with them is like a score. The church organ is like a scoring instrument. Yeah. 
and the church is like a context they move into and through and that, that holds them like, 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 like they are the jewel in, in, in the crown. Right, And right. then they exit, and when they exit, they like have fanfare, yeah. you know? So it's, that's sort of how the whole thing is created, and from a technical perspective, and lighting, and super titling, and all of it, it, it all is that way. Right, to all create that experience. That, that experience, I love yeah. that idea, this, the, the human beings in the center are the very jewel. Yeah, yeah. and it is the fellowship of the choir that is, that, that, that is created through that experience that is the heart of the project. Yeah. And by giving it that perspective from a producing standpoint, it, it clarifies everything. Yeah. And so I have to get the whole technical team on this page and the presenting organizations on this page. Right, right. And, it, and they are on this page. Yeah. So that's what this project does, which is really different than other projects I've had. It's, well, it's really different. Was it hard to just yeah. to like, I mean, um, the kind of working in the kind of choral milieu that you're working in now, what did you need to learn from when you were doing kind of your own solo work and then just from like Dukesman stuff? I mean, how did you get from Dukesman to here? Um, Do you mean it's just like, did you have to learn new things in terms of choral directing or? You know, <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, I've, I've never studied conducting, but I, because I was the music director of the, the Dukesman, I, I'm confident in, in, yeah, in doing right, it. Right. Um, and I think, I don't know, the Dukesman were a profoundly useful experience for me, music directing a group of 21 people. It translates pretty well to, to, con, to a 50. Yeah. Um, I, I think one of the things that actually, like, I feel like I, 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 between the Dukesman here that, that that really influenced me was the fact that everything I do in life is predicated by the fact that I sing pretty. Yeah. It really is, like I sing pretty. Yeah. I have the ability to, when I sing, everybody stops and goes, wow. That's true. It's like I'm still singing in my head as I could, could rode my bike up here. Yeah, and I use, I, and I, I've never, it's always just come to me naturally and I've never had any, the slightest bit of interest in, in that fact. Yeah. Outside of that, it's the thing I use as a foothold to do all the things I really want to do. <laughs> so I'm like, that's fine, you think I'm seeing pretty and you hire me because I sing pretty, but now I'm going to produce an, a, a, an hour and 15 long theatrical interdisciplinary pr performance where I'm exploring my video design <laughs> <laughs> and my producing skills, right. and I put my singing pretty at the center of it so that you can have what you want. Yeah. You know what I mean? You have what you want, and I'm going to get what I want. And this is how my career has sort of developed. Yeah. It's all oriented around me singing pretty. Now, the thing about that is that I, have a, I know that there's a certain power to me singing, but I have this really profound belief that anybody singing is music whether they think they're good or bad, yeah. that you can work, that there's a way to do it. I have all these things I do, these tricks, you know, and, and, this, and, and maybe people who aren't singing all the time like I am don't have them. But I just saw um, that, 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 what is it called? Is it uh, Dream Girls over yeah, in the right. Berkeley Playhouse? Yeah. And I heard that the lead fell out and the understudy took her place. I, who's the lead in that? It was Jennifer Hudson. She, what's the character's name? Does anybody know this? She's the one who sings, You're Gonna Love Me. It's this, anyway, she has this amazing moment. Um, it's Jennifer Hudson sings it in the movie. I never saw the movie, but where she had, the, the woman who was the understudy, I felt like either didn't have the range for the part or had just, this was the end of the run and she'd lost her voice. And she steps out to sing this song, which was about how everyone had abandoned her, but they, that she was gonna keep going. And she couldn't sing it. And, and she, she did the most amazing thing. She just completely worked with it. And it was, I, I was in tears by the end. It was like watching, it was, she integrated the whole experience and everyone in the audience was just like rooting her on as she was like, ah! and um, it was profound. Wow, it was profound. Yeah. So I really have no regard for singing pretty. I think it's really overrated. Yeah. And, and, and so a part of this project was that anybody could come do it. They don't, Anybody can come. Right, there's you don't have no, to have a master's degree in music. There's you no can, audition. There's no audition. Yeah. You can be tone deaf. I don't care. Yeah. It's, you know, that's, that's not my problem. And, and I, I find over and over people who perceive themselves as tone deaf uh, aren't. They're not tone deaf. And anyway, rhythm is the first element of music. I mean, you could just speak along with us and we'd be fine. It's a yeah. choir. I mean, it's, there's, it, there's, there's something that just happens. People find their way. People find their way. So, yeah. um, so I think the thing that happened between the Dukesmen, to sum it up, and now is that I have, uh, I've, I've developed a, a strong interest in everyone's ability to self-organize in a magical way through music. Yeah. And I think it's like a metaphor for how we create peace on earth 
you know. Yeah, and I think also singing pretty is just getting less and less important. I mean, you're, you're, you're being able to do what you really want to do, but without having to leverage yourself in that way. And it, yeah, and I only sing one thing in the show, and everyone afterwards says, I really wish I'd heard you sing more, and I'm just like, ha, <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Good. <laughs> Good. <No. laughs> I mean, I feel badly, but I'm also kind of like, well, I'm going to have a concert next January, and you're not even going to make it. Yeah. I don't even know what you're talking about. Right. That's, I'm a little snarky right now. Well, but the, 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 but you're, yeah. you're right, but if the jewel in this whole beautiful thing Choir. is the choir yeah. then you singing like five parts is gonna is gonna detract from that yeah yeah it's not about me yeah. it's it's i so i do one thing which i feel like is the one thing i'm i'm really good at which yeah. is i extemporaneously read the audience's prayer cards essentially back to oh, them yeah and it's i someone else could do it but I feel like it's it's sort of the thing I do. Yeah, we're grateful yeah. for it. Thanks. Yeah, um, um, we have a tradition in, in our in our uh, of t taking questions. Great. So um, people have note cards, and Rebecca will um, collect your your questions um, um, for Holcomb. But um, one of the projects that I've read about that I don't know as much about, but I've, yeah. I've been dying to ask you about it, is the wayfinding project. Oh. And your interest in wayfinding. <laughs> Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Well, I mean, how much, how do you want me to talk about it? Well, like in real terms? Like, I feel like you're so smart. I just need to give you the give you the tea. Um, Wayfinders. I'm gonna I'm gonna describe this like I describe it to like my best friend, yeah. not like how I do it in a public forum. Right. Wayfinders. I've I started creating interdisciplinary theater-based music concerts that were exploring mise en scène um, uh, elements of video design, lighting, and presenting music as total theater as a kind of thing I was interested in doing. And I started doing that in 2007. Six and seven. And Wayfinders represents the culmination of a series of evening length works I'd made. It had a cast of 10, it had a budget of, I don't even remember how much money. It had, it had probably $60,000 of audio vi video gear on the stage. And it was probably the worst awful experience of my entire <laughs> oh, life. No. It was a year that, 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 it was 2014, it was the year that, that went into Requiem. And yeah. I collapsed at the end into depression. Um, and, uh, but I still to this day think it's one of the best things I ever did. And what's so amazing is that it was wholeheartedly rejected by every single critic. It was destroyed. People went online to write about it just to be as mean as they could be. Uh. Um, the cast and crew had infighting and fell apart. The oh, presenters gosh. felt dissatisfied. And I thought it was profound. <laughs> Um, but uh, it was a total personal disaster. Yeah, yeah. The piece, w it was initially inspired by a book um, by an anthropologist named Wade Davis called Wayfinders. Oh, and you. the book um, explores how the, the disappearing indigenous people and the disappearing uh, multiplicity of languages and cultures um, right now are erasing mankind's history of solving the most critical and um, existential questions issues that we have, including things like climate change and having cultural priorities yeah. of, of sustainability. So he makes that argument. And one of the things referenced is the Polynesian navigators who wayfinded on the open ocean before the chronometer existed, before latitude and longitude existed, by dead reckoning based on everything from the direction of the wind to the size of the waves to the color of the water to the, the fish and the birds they could see. And they could get in a canoe from like 2,000 2, nautical miles onto a pinpoint. And they didn't just do it once, they did it all the time. Yeah, yeah, and that yeah. is how Polynesia was populated. Yeah. And this was a story that became erased when European um, discoverers spread diseases that killed everybody. Right, right. But um, uh, um, uh, a man in Hawaii named, uh, I'm uh, sorry, name blanking, brought the ancient Polynesian Nanoa wayfinding. Thompson. Nanoa Thompson brought the ancient canoe wayfinding techniques back and successfully made the trip between Hawaii and Easter Island, which is kind of like trying to sort of canoe to the moon with no instruments. You know what I mean? It's just. And he did it many times yeah. with a team of young people learning these techniques. So the piece used that as a point of inspiration. But then what it really did is it looked at technology and how we might be losing our way. How do we, f how do we create cultural priorities? How do we get somewhere when we're lost in a kind of miasma of virtuality, right. of like losing connection with each other? I mean, we get, we're going to be getting in a car pretty soon and not even looking up and just getting out at our location. And we won't even know how we got there. Right, because we'll be too busy tweeting. Yeah, way. I mean, we already don't even know each other's phone numbers. Yeah. So it's like, 
this was what the piece was looking at, right? And, and I thought it was like profound, and everyone else thought it was hideous, awful disaster. And um, at the end, yeah, it was a terrible experience. And then just to kind of connect it back to Requiem, in 2014, it premiered at BAM, and half my friends in New York didn't come because they were like washing their hair. <laughs> and I, I, at that time, I literally was like, this town is dead, I'm never coming back. Uh -huh. And I kind of haven't gone back, but I'm ready to go back. Yeah. But it's been four years, you know. And, uh, you know, there's a way in which you can talk about technology and almost no one else can because you do have that experience of, of getting all the tech gear from the friend in L.A. And, you know, you, you, like music, as, as music has, has adopted these technologies, I mean, you've been there from the very beginning of that. I mean, so how does technology just change our relation to music? I mean, you know, what does technology mean? What it, you know, and, and I don't mean just the, like, creation of the, the, the pieces of music, but, mm. you know, how they're disseminated, how they're... Yeah, advertise how we know about them. I mean, we, you know, what do you have to say about just technology and, and its future? I love wayfinding, by the way, as like a, a, like a preliminary answer to that. Well, I, I'm, I, the way I'd approach the question, I would just think about children and their relationship with technology because when you think about the future, just look to the kids and how do they do it. And all of you know, you know, your little nieces and nephews and they'll take your phone and do something with it. You're like, wow, how'd you do that? Yeah. And, um, that's the future. The, and what I think that means is that technology is going to integrate developmentally with human beings. And of course, you talk about the cyborgs and blah, 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 and all those people, no, 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 who sort of theorize on that stuff. But I think whatever kids are doing with technology, you can be assured is going to be not just what technology does, but like how humanity integrates with right, it. Right. And in Wayfinding, we had this, the, the concept was that Th these people had so fully immersed themselves in technology, they could no longer necessarily know the difference between it and themselves. And when the whole thing took place on, a, on, a sh on an escape pod that had been shot into space from a dying earth, like a seed from a dying tree, mm -hmm. with six people in it who were the instrumentalists, and one by one they were dying. And the pro the, 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 that one of them had died and the flute player was dying, and the flute player had to give the, her last and most final permission to have herself uploaded into the, right. into the system. Yeah. And the, the question was, if, if she gave that final most subtle permission to be uploaded, would she still be alive? Mm -hmm. Or would she just be this kind of simulcrum of what she once was? Yeah. And would it matter? It's so it's kind of dealt in these issues of like extending life and mortality and technology, but being completely lost in the virtual reality and being un unable to even know like if, if you know, wh what to do, where yeah, to go. Yeah. So, so it was a really bizarre piece and I was really into it. But anyway, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I can't say I'm prescient, I have any sort of prescient future looking thing. I just look to kids and, and I can tell that, you know, developmentally they're doing things with technology that I find very interesting. Yeah. And I think the thing as adults and, and, and we have to focus on is not so much protecting them from technology, but guiding them morally, yeah. guiding them culturally, uh, to use their abilities with technology towards just and right ends. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think that can happen. I'm very optimistic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. me too. Yeah, yeah that's, that's great. Um, so here's one of the questions that we have. Um, some parts of the Requiem lyrics are funny. How does humor figure into the reverence of the Requiem? I love that. There's yeah. a lot of funny parts of the Bible, too, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, like, getting deep into the Bible, or at least certain yeah, parts of yeah. it, I kept, I've, I have a lot more respect for it. Um, I have a lot of respect for it, I should yeah, say. Yeah. I guess I can't say more because it was just one thing I didn't really know about before. Right. Um, so yeah, I think the piece, because it's LGBTQ um, oriented, the one aspect, if you come, you'll see, is that we have a huge balloon installation and sparkle streamers that are a part of the aesthetic. And we have something we call the Queen James Bible, which uh. is the most bejeweled, mirrored thing you have ever seen. Probably second only to the incredible gold and silver metallic polished book, bookcase yes, you have, have that right. is like the gayest thing I have ever seen. <laughs> We, we very, use that as yeah. a model, and we just blew it up. Like, yeah, I mean, and it's twice the size. 
And um, it's heavy too. It's oh yeah, yours is heavy. Yeah, I, heavy. Yes, and ours is as well. <laughs> um, um, so we use uh, we the scenic designer said, well, celebration and partying, and uh, in many respects, has been a part of the kind of colorful history of oppression and persecution, yeah. and that to, to survive, you always have to sort of, you know, bring partying to light so he you know celebrating what in whatever form that that was so he wanted to, to so in this funerary kind of memorializing invocation of peaceful repose he wanted to bring those elements in and the piece itself start is is very concerned around the acquirer's experience of empowerment you know as 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 people so it has a lot of that spirit particularly at the beginning and particularly at the end and in, the, and in the middle, it kind of does descend in a way to this very dark place where we sing Psalm 22, which is uh, sort of mashed up with the, um, uh, the section of the Latin mass called um, uh, Pia Jesu. Yeah. Which, uh, and Psalm 22 is like a physical description of the process of dying, yeah. you know. And so it goes to this place that is about mortal death and feeling abandoned by God in this moment and having to have faith in your faith, um, which is kind of what Psalm 22 sort of says. Um, and, uh, and that my interpretation, I mean, it says a lot of things, I'm sure. And, and, uh, and then it, it lifts from that, the sermon, we have a sermon, and then it sort of lifts from that in the in paradisum, which is literally about the ascendance of the spirit to heaven. But right. in ours, I translate it almost like directions, like someone's dying, you're like, head for the gates, go right at the martyrs, go right for the angels, they're singing, you can't miss them. <laughs> uh, it's sort of, that's the spirit of it. And, 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 and it has this big amen. And after that, we have a benediction and exit music, which is actually the Beatitudes, right. which Jeffrey Hookham suggested, we need something that is the sending forth. And, and so it's called the sending forth the Beatitudes. And so it, it, which I also call the original It Gets Better campaign. The Beatitudes <laughs> are the original It Gets Better campaign. Uh, you know, the Bible had that meme yes. down thousands of years ago. <laughs> it's like, it sucks now, but greater your rewards in heaven. Uh, yeah. And if, you, if you, and if you think about it, if you wanted to believe that heaven was maybe some point in your life on earth, then yeah, you know, it's, it's like the It Gets Better campaign. Yeah, definitely. So, um, and if they don't get better, well, they get better afterwards. <laughs> so it gets better eventually. But, uh, uh, so the piece kind of mixes this kind of empowerment of the choir, kind of bookended on either ends with this kind of descent, as, with this layer of um, these party elements that are very formally presented. You know, these balloon letters are, it, it's been months getting, to, to construct balloons the way they look, you'll see, it's, it, it, it takes, I can't even tell you what it's taken. They're in a, they're in a what do you call it, um, where the color fades to another color? Yeah. It's, it's ridiculous. Anyway, you have to come see it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can't. I remember seeing the drawings of the balloons from the very beginning. Yeah, just yeah. Just to imagine. Yeah. yeah. But it was important for me that for the piece to have an uplifting spirit to it because to me, when we pray for the peaceful repose of people who've been persecuted, we cannot help but also be, be imagining a, a, the, 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 the parallel experience in life. And that those people who are suffering and being persecuted in life, which includes ourselves in very various ways, yeah. um, that it gets better, that, 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 we can, that we can find peace, and that we can find it while we're alive, yeah. you know, as well as have people pray for us when we're dead. Um, so it's sort of this cross message of it. It's not explicitly stated, but there's that feeling to it, I think. Yeah, I had a teenager. Um, I did, gave, gave a, 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 a kind of a tour of the cathedral to a high school religion class. At the end, this one woman, a girl, a you know, 16-year-old, 17-year-old, she came up to me and she wanted to talk to me privately. She said, I know the goal of Christianity is getting into heaven. And then she said all this stuff. I said, well, you know, actually the goal of Christianity isn't getting into heaven. It's a thing called the kingdom of God, this realm <laughs> of God, this, and, and sometimes we have an experience of it here when we love and kind and we have a sense of connection and, and that's what it is that you're describing mm -hmm. to me is like it, it's yeah. like a it, it's it's a sense of connection and love and a, a affection and care um, that we experience right now and that's mm -hmm. what this thing is all about um, and, it, and Christians have this hope that you, when you're connected to God in the future that that's the feeling that you have too yeah, and I do, I do we sing the beatitude I completely agree this is yeah. the this kingdom of God idea is in the end, we try to, I mean, I literally, I, there's this amazing solo to sing the last song, it's the Beatitudes. And the one line I sort of change is that, 
you know, they, uh, you know, uh, it, it's, uh, I can't, uh, it's yeah, a, blessed are the meek, for they shall yeah, be blessed are you, and blessed are you when you're persecuted, yeah, for righteousness, for sake, um, exactly, for, for, um, uh, yeah, for righteousness sake, yeah, I'm trying to remember, how does it, uh, towards the end, oh, anyway, but he, there's, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, yeah. and then he says, and, and this departs from the text, and he, at the end, he says, on all of this is heaven, yeah, yeah, exactly. So go forth in the fullness of your blessing. Oh, that's that's cool. sort of how the whole piece ends. Not to give it away, but I, <laughs> I, I like spoilers. I like spoilers because I just gave you the end, and now you can see how we get there, which yeah, is really the completely. most important part. It is. Yeah. Um, yeah. What happens next with the Requiem, um, and then what's next for you? Two good questions. Uh, I never know what's next for me. Um, <laughs> I'm remodeling my basement is what's next for me. I, I literally, after we pl- wrap this up, I drive home and start remodeling my basement. Um, but uh, we are, the Requiem is going to, to Sydney in February. Uh, right out, it's funny because we presented this in, in September 15 and in February 16, this, a small queer performing arts organization brought the Requiem to Sydney in a condensed kind of community engagement process. And they loved it. Um, in Australia, they're very, they're, it's a very different relationship they have with the Anglican Church and politics oh, yeah, there. They didn't true. have marriage equity at that time. Yeah. They have it now, but it, they're, they're an amazingly conservative uh, leadership uh, in government, and then people are just like, what is with these people? And yet somehow just they always get reelected. Um, it's, a, it's a totally different thing that's happening yeah. there. So they have something called the Sydney Gay and Lesbian Mardi Gras, which is like a pride festival. It's, this big, it's big. It's bigger than San Francisco Pride, and it spans an entire month. And they do a lot of uh, performing arts presenting. So they're bringing the work back, and they're presenting it in a big concert hall. And they're inviting the, the volunteer choir that performed it to join a professional standing choir and then together oh. have this big presentation of it. So Will that's you be the person next. who's producing it in the same way, or...? I will come for two weeks. A music director will teach the music. Some of the music is quite aleatoric and extemporaneous. I will come and focus on those elements and on the kind of theatrical ceremonial presentation, um, which is a little, I guess, outside the pay grade of a music director, I guess. I mean, it's not in mine either. I just take the initiative to right. give myself the take right a to risk. do it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, here's the, uh, the, the, another question. Has your tech career influenced your music career? That's a good question. Well, my tech career was short-lived, and it has influenced my music career because I made so much money <laughs> for about four years. At the end of that time, I owned a condo in the Mission. Let's see, I bought the condo a year into my job, back when you could just do what was called a, a no-documentation loan. I benefited from all that. I sold the place and moved to Portland, as they say, like young people go there to retire. Yeah. A part of my whole thing was um, I left San Francisco in 2004 or five because I wanted to become a full-time artist, and I didn't want to work in a corporate environment anymore. And so I had made a lot of money. I had saved a lot of money. I had bought a condo that appreciated. I sold it, and I cashed in. And I kind of funded my life for five years while yeah. I tried to s- establish a career as a performing artist and figure out all the various ways that you do that. I thought at that time maybe I'd have some mainstream music success and uh, that was sort of the tail end of the, of the kind of, oh, I think I'm a little too gay for the mainstream music industry mm. experience. Um, and you know, various other factors I'm sure. Um, and that was also when I sort of found my entree into the performing arts. So I think the tech career helped to fund my funding of my own career um, by giving me ridiculous amounts of money doing absolutely nothing for four or five years. Yeah. Other than show up in an office and figure out different ways to express how busy I am while I'm not actually doing anything. <laughs> Um, I, yeah, I, I, when I left, I almost wanted to write a musical about it. I still, there's still one song from the musical mm-hmm. that I can't, I never forget, because printing was always such an issue, printing. It was like everything came down to how we couldn't print. I don't know if I can say it, it has an expletive in it. Can I say the S word in this context? I think you can say it downstairs, probably, you know, yeah. Can I no. say it down here? It's, it's sung. It's sung. It's sung. Yeah, let's okay. hear it. Okay, so it, it, the, the, there was like an executive assistant, and she's trying, this was in the musical, trying to, to print the, the, her boss, who's real, a real jerk, is like, uh, but gives her 50 things to do, and he's like, oh, and by the way, print this out. I need it in 20 minutes. And she like takes it, and the music starts. And it's like, 
all the challenges she's had at printing start coming out of her mouth, but then she gets to the course, she's like, but I'm going to print that shit out. <laughs> and they, they chime in from the cubicles, print it out, print it out, yes. <laughs> I'm going to print that shit out. And she just goes on, and it, becomes, it keeps like escalating, and then she, she prints it out. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm glad you told us how. Thank it you. Sir. I would have been so. Uh, yeah. So I, it hasn't really influenced my career very directly, other than it, it funded the initiation of my kind of full-time career, yeah. while I was still figuring out how to earn a, a decent living. Right. Yeah. Right. Which is a constant challenge. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I just, I definitely think about that as you take, you achieve each goal, and you know the, what the next thing is. It's, yeah, when a project ends, it's like kind of like being fired. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I, on, mon on Sunday, I'm fired. <laughs> you know, my job yeah. ends, and I have to start the next one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I know it's going to be fixing the basement. If, if, if you don't want to tell us anything more about just like what your artistic work is going to be, that's okay. Um, I mean, you have probably ideas that are rough hewn that are... Yeah, I do have a few ideas. Um, well, I've actually just been wanting to get back to songwriting and concerting, which is something I haven't done lately. So like that song, Hardliners, it's yeah. just a process of songwriting and concerting. And I sort of haven't been doing that. And people have sort of missed it yeah. in my world, and I've missed it. And I actually, for a long time, I was having a very kind of hard time, various reasons. I mean, just a lot of things happened um, over the last five or six years that were very hard. And I... I just wasn't able to write a thing. And lately, yeah. I've just been full of inspiration about just things to write, just personal things. Um, and so I, I would like to focus on that. Oh, great. And I, am think, I do think about technology and the way we consume music right now. And, and for me, the way that young people consume um, is entirely visually. It's, it's videos. It, they watch videos and they look at photographs online. And so if you want to convey a song to them, you, you, you have to deliver it as a video. Wow. So I'm, I'm, my interest is to create a set of new music that I write specifically to perform for video. And I'm a video designer. So I'm going to use my projectors and my camera to create real-time performances that um, sort of do, do a lot with wow. video. And I hope to try and start working on that. I've been talking about this for a while, but it's like I never quite have the time or space to do it because it is something that's not like funded necessarily. It's right. just... It sounds so exciting. I, I, I mean, know. I can't wait to see, see it when it's done, you know? I can't either. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do you, um, when, when you think of us, like, remembering this day and your visit, I mean, you know, what would you most want us as the audience to kind of take away from, from this conversation? What, 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 do you, what are your last words for us? Well, something we haven't really talked about yet is just how incredible Grace has been in this process. Mm. Um, and Rebecca, she's been the, 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 the sort of, she's back there again, she's the wallflower back there, but uh -huh. um, Rebecca is the first entree I had into Grace through a mutual friend, Andy Loban, who oh, was, yeah, right. Andy Andy's Loban, great, yeah. who was a, 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 a temporarily placed here. And, um, and, and it's been a real process, you know, this is a big institution, YBSA is a big institution, so it's been an amazing process, which uh, Rebecca has just really turned out in every possible way. It's just been amazing for me that um, Grace as a, as a community resource is so open and available. I've got, I'm actually living in the apartment right now in the yeah. chapter house and I have that privilege of just being here 24 hours a day and seeing all of the staff here and just the level of service. It transcends religion obviously to yeah. just, it, it becomes about community and um, the performing arts and the visual arts and just the acknowledgement of the, the, of the space as a community resource, I mean, it's just incredible. I mean, it's like the ultimate community center. It's, yeah. Um, and I just love that about it. And I love that you've opened the, your doors to this process, and I think it means so much to people in the choir and people even at Yerba Buena Center. There is this kind of awe and this kind of untouchability sometimes in people's minds about these kinds of spaces. And while certainly certain things within it are so sacred you shouldn't put anything on it, generally the space is there for you to walk into and to be in, and it's yeah. there for you. And it's just been amazing to work that way here and to kind of invite everyone in the project into that way of thinking. Um, and I, I think that really does change everyone's minds about um, the role that religious institutions can have in culture. Um, whether or not you're in the congregation, whether or not you're a believer, 
you can be there in fellowship with the people who are. You can be there in fellowship with people, with each other who maybe are not in the congregation or believers, but you know that this is a space for, you know, humanity and, and that sort of thing. I just think there's this great convergence of that that's happening here, which I really, really like, yeah. you know, and I think I just applaud you and, and really this institution for, for, and Rebecca for, for, for so actively working that way. It's yeah. really great. You're just it full is. of laughs. <laughs> yeah. And you know, I'm so glad. Uh, you are, I'm so glad that nice. you can see it too. Do you know what I mean? Because it, it, it's sometimes hard for people to get that this is for everybody. Yeah. You know, the the, the purpose is that everybody can eat from like, bread from a silver platter or drink mm-hmm. from a golden cup or oh, yeah. be in a sit in a th- something that's like a throne. I mean, it is. And and we are Rebecca's behind the scenes always. Yeah. But I mean, she her education and her wisdom is you know what makes a forum possible. I, I mean. Yeah. She just, she knows who to yeah. invite and what we should talk about, et cetera. So yeah. thank you, Rebecca. Yeah. Well, we're so yeah. glad and to have you. you. Yeah. We um, are going to um, have next week uh, an extraordinary forum guest. It's Marion Nessel, who, if you read the New York Times, this woman is in the New York Times like every other week. Anytime the New York Times has a question about nutrition, she is on, on board. So um, it'll be a great conversation about the truth about what we eat. Like, um, how do we know what's good for us and what's not? And how are large companies? companies involved in kind of distorting what the facts are about what's nutritious food. Um, you're invited to join us upstairs for the Requiem, a foray Requiem. It's going to be beautiful at the 11 o'clock service. Um, and also, we'd like to request, if you can make a gift, we'd really appreciate it. It helps make the um, forum possible. And Holcomb, it's just been such a gift to get Love to know this. you better here. And thank, um, you. thank you so much for bringing your, your creativity and your vision and your heart and your passion and your humanity to, to Grace Cathedral. We're so grateful to have you this thank week. Thank you for having us. Yeah, yeah. great. Yeah, thanks for coming.